uh, tonight's program, Constructing an Image, a conversation with Atlanta Latinx photographers, will explore how matters of identity, community, and history are explored through photography. Photographers Victoria Garcia and Jose Barrizo are joining us this evening in a conversation moderated by history professor Yami Rodriguez. Um, just a short story about how this panel came to be. Uh, back in March, the Carlos Museum hosted a large meeting with faculty, administrators, uh, student life staff to share a little bit about our upcoming exhibition uh, coming to us from Aperture, You Belong Here, Place, People, and Purpose in Latinx Photography. Almost immediately after we gave an overview of the exhibition, Yami raised her hand and asked, where are the artists from the Southeast? And this rapidly became a guiding question for us as we began developing programs and even future exhibitions. Yami was kind enough to meet me for coffee shortly after. And as we talked and brainstormed ways for students to be involved and supported and how we could bring in the larger Atlanta community, it became clear that Yami knew everyone. And when I say everyone, I mean everyone. <laughs> um, I feel like I met a professor who'd been on campus for maybe two days and we were talking about possibilities of the museum partnering with her class. And I mentioned uh, a conversation I'd had with Yami. They're like, oh yeah, I know Yami. I met them. <laughs> um, she was able to list artists, community groups, students, faculty, and staff faster than I could write. Uh, she's been such a champion of the exhibition and using the museum as a space for education and we couldn't be more grateful. It is through her that we were able to connect with two phenomenal artists, Victoria, whose upbringing in Atlanta's International Village or Buford Highway informs her work at the intersection of art and activism as it pertains to immigration policy, diaspora, and gentrification. And Jose, whose work primarily focuses on identity and is currently exploring the migrant experience in the American South. We are thrilled to host this conversation in conjunction with You Belong Here and is co-sponsored by Atlanta Photography Group and Gallery. Please join me in welcoming Jose Barrizo, Victoria Garcia, and Yami Rodriguez. Can y'all hear me? Yes. Thank y'all so much for joining us this evening. Um, and thank you, Katie, for that wonderful introduction. Um, yeah, if y'all know me, y'all know very well, my hand was immediately in the air. We're the local artists. Thankfully, I know some really amazing people that are Southern, that are Latinx, that are amazing photographers, and that agreed to be in conversation with me this evening. So thank y'all so much for accepting that invitation. Um, so I'm gonna be a moderator. We're gonna try and have this as an organic conversation. We will leave time at the end for a Q and A. Um, but I want to you know, let the audience know a bit more that when we were brainstorming for this event, some major keywords came up, right? For how we might structure this conversation. And these three of these keywords included identity, community, and history, specifically as related to Latinx photography. And when I say photography, I mean as a practice, as an art form, and because I'm a historian, as a sort of process of archive building, right? So I wanna begin by asking Victoria and Jose uh, to walk us through their personal lives, their personal identities first, before getting to broader questions about community and how your photogra photographic work really intersects with matters of community representation and history. Well, let's start with the personal. Uh, could you each tell us a little bit about where you grew up and how you understand your personal and or familial connection to the South? Let's, Jose's still nodding, so he's still thinking. Let's start with, with, with Victoria. <laughs> Um, so I was born in Lawrenceville, so I'm born and raised in the metro Atlanta area. Uh, I identify as a Southern pretty strongly, but at the intersection of being a Southerner and Chicana, uh, my father is from Jalisco, Mexico, and my mother is a uh, Tejana, so I am also come from a mixed background family. Um, yeah, I uh, after I was born in Duquesnet, but grew up in Dorville. Just recently moved back to that area last year. Um, I wanted to maintain a pretty strong connection to the area that I grew up in, and it influences a lot of like the work that I do, not just artistically, but even in my involvement in like community organizing work. It's 
naturally, if you get into stuff around immigration policy, you're going to be hanging out around Beaufort Highway a lot because that's where our people are pretty concentrated. And so for all these different reasons, it being like a core part of my identity growing up there and it giving me a really good like worldview of all these different cultures and like working class people, uh, my political involvement, and then also it artistically inspiring me a lot. I think like one of the biggest influences in doing what I do is is like the neighborhood that I'm from. So, um, Jose, before we turn to you to tell us about your uh, where you grew up, your country to the south, you mentioned your mom's Tejana. Mm -hmm. Does she identify as a southerner? Hmm, that's a tricky question. <laughs> yeah, that, I'm, students in my class will know why I'm asking this. It's something that we're always trying to figure out in Latinx history, right? In yeah, history. I think that's something that she even questions about herself. Like she calls herself a Southerner, but then she's like, I'm a Southerner, but like I'm Texan. It's like, they always I'm y'all, but like I'm also different. Texas always got <laughs> to be different. All right, now I get it. I'm from Houston too, I get it. Jose, <laughs> can you tell us a little bit about where you grew up and your sort of personal familial connection to the region? Yeah, sure thing. Uh, thanks for being here, everybody. Um, I was born in León, Guanajuato, Mexico, and I was there until I was the age of seven. Um, you know, one day my mom's like, we're packing up and we're going to go be with your father. So we embarked on like this five-day journey across the border as undocumented immigrants uh, to Georgia. So um, I'm now a U.S. citizen, so for context. Um, and I was undocumented for five years. Um, I had legal residency at the age of 12, but yeah, that that kind of, you know, the way I approach my art is through that lens as an immigrant. Um, so that's kind of the starting point for my practice. And, um, my uncles worked in California for a long time and picking avocados, oranges, working on large farms and one of them somehow heard about the the poultry industry in Gainesville so uh if you don't know anything Gainesville is the poultry capital of the world um so I've been there since 1999 and yeah I mean I I rep Gainesville so hard uh it just kind of like influences every aspect of my of of how I think about life how I approach my art so yeah, um, yeah, big, big immigrant community, mm -hmm. poultry, construction, so on and so forth. And I wanna ask this just cause you visited uh, my classroom before, I've seen some of your exhibits. So I wanna ask if you can share with the audience, um, kind of like Vicky who, you know, your mom has this connection to the South-ish. You have, your family has a connection to the South that you learned about when you began your photography journey. I was wondering if you can tell the audience a little bit about your grandpa. Oh yeah, sure thing. So uh, in March, I had my second exhibition here in Atlanta and, you know, I was doing some research where, well, this body of work, I really wanted to look inwards. Uh, the first exhibition was about, you know, portraits of other people. This time I wanted to really reflect on my own experience as an immigrant, kind of trying to make an archive of our history as immigrants here in America. And through conversations, you know, a lot of what what we know about our families is all oral history, right? So, uh, you know, casually, I was having a conversation with my dad. And he's like, you know, your grandpa was here in the 60s. I knew that, but I didn't know that he was actually in Memphis picking cotton in the 60s, part of the Bracetto program. And that just really blew my mind because... I was like, we're the first ones here, right? Thinking my family, like my my uncles and I, and and just kind of thinking about like he told me he's like, yeah, your 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 grandpa would be fishing over there. Uh, I don't know what major rivers over there, but you know, just thinking about like my grandpa in the sixties doing those things in the south, that was really full circle. So so yeah. No, thank you for sharing that. Um, and I want to highlight something here too that um, the three of us sitting up here are. First 1.5 generation Southerners of Mexican, Mexican American origins. And we all came to live in Georgia because of labor migrations, right? You mentioned your father coming for the poultry processing. My father came for construction. 
Vicky, I was wondering, um, I know a little bit about this. If you could share the audience a little bit about what brought your family south. So uh, similarly, I found out by asking lots of questions, like Jose did, asking my dad. And there was a, um, I forget time and like since COVID happened, I don't know if, I think it was last year that Nuestro South, uh, that was part of their storytelling cohort. Oh. Was last, yeah, year? last year I was your advisor I should know this yeah 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 last year <laughs> <laughs> and they were like uh they were doing trainings for oral histories and so I was like let me start with my dad you know that's easy and so I started asking him things and immediately I was like whoa I didn't know anything about this like that he came to California and he said he he his family back and like the rancho that they're from in Jalisco knew about work in uh, the Bay Area. So he went there and he worked in landscaping. Never knew this man had worked in landscaping. And then that it wasn't, I think there was like shipbuilding or something. I can't remember what else, but that it wasn't going well for him there. So other family from the rancho told him about work in New Orleans. And so he worked in New Orleans and I still do have some like a few I guess of like my immediate family I have an uncle over there um but and some more extended family in New Orleans but um I think the work wasn't as good in New Orleans in like the late 80s so I think in 88 or 89 was the year that he moved to Atlanta and he moved to Norcross um so I like uh thinking about that just because it challenges that idea that like everyone came around the time of the olympics which is something that we talked a lot about during that that uh that summer with like nuestro south as everyone has talks about like, the nuevo south was the olympics but a lot of us were here before then and like the time that my dad moved to norcross he said there were so few Mexicans that like he couldn't even get chiles in the stores, which I don't know. He may be exaggerating, he, but he's not exaggerating. <laughs> there were no chiles. There were no tortillas. In Bayala. And he's, <laughs> but he mentioned that like there were so few Mexicans back then that, I mean, he didn't always have a car. So if wherever he needed to go, he would go walking. And that sometimes like police would pull him over just for, uh, just for like being a pedestrian and, back in the day i mean still so in gwinnett county but um it wasn't okay for racialized people to be visible out on the street walking so um yeah so he went across the south uh, made different decisions like in his career based off of like all these family connections it was like word of mouth and like oh i trabajo in you know landscaping here or like whatever here, but he ended up settling in Atlanta uh, and works in framing and has had pretty consistent work in that since then. No, thank you all for sharing. And um, I'm sorry, I end up turning everything into a labor history, but that's just kind of what I focus on and what I find really fun. Um, I'm really curious, you know, we've talked a little bit about uh, our shared lived experiences, our distinct lived experiences. How did your experiences here in the South inform your decision to go into photography. And that may seem like I'm making a big jump, right? But we're talking right now about how we had to excavate for history at the family dinner table, right? We're talking about how it's been hard to identify local Southern Latinx history. So often we look to our families. So I guess my question comes from wondering if photography was an early effort to understand either a history of place-based identity, if it started for fun and turned into a career, what led you to choose this practice? <laughs> I know that's a big question. I'm sorry, y'all. Okay. Uh, yeah, that is a massive question. Um, okay, so I think you know my my artistic background is uh, comes from drawing and painting, right? So I think I was it was a I was in a period where I was really frustrated with how slow I painted. So I wanted to make images faster, but the point, the goal has always been the same to tell stories, right? So uh, photography really lended itself to be able to make images faster and to consider them and to think about them and to, you know, visually tell those stories that I've like, for years I've been thinking about making, right? That, oh, this painting can do this and that. But uh, I was a kid that talked crap about photography in college uh, because there is a hierarchy uh, and that's unspoken of. Can you tell us a little bit about that for folks who are not in art history? I, or maybe, is that a soft 
tense subject? No, I mean, I, I don't have any feelings about it. I mean, I think my feelings have changed, of course, but uh, yeah, it's, it, it's looked like it's looked down upon, like it's not one of the higher arts, like where you actually, you know, painting or sculpting so on and so forth. So I was subscribing to that really dumb mentality. Um, and it really happened organically. Um, you know, I tell this story, she's heard it a million times, but my girlfriend's a professional wedding photographer. Erica, raise your hands up. <laughs> Hi, Erica. <laughs> and she was wanting to make uh, learn film and, uh, you know, she's busy. So I kind of rolled with it and never really looked back. And the medium just really lended itself to photograph people that, you know, have always, you know, sparked an interest in me. I saw a similarity. Long story short, um, what began, um, I saw this project called The New Black Vanguard. It's a beautiful publication where the Black community was really trying to gain ownership of their image, but doing it in a really tasteful manner. And I saw that book and I was like, you know, like, where where do we see images of us in that same light? So that was that was like a really... That was a motivator, but it was like a little superficial. Like now as the work has evolved, it's turned into something a little deeper. And then like the second iteration of the work that I've been making lately, it's like, it's more about how, how is it that I'm able to see myself through the images that I'm making? How is it reflecting? Uh, what speaks to me? What I identify as? So yeah, I mean, it's taking me through this this beautiful journey and it, it's just like this medium that just really lended itself to, to the stories I want to be telling. No, I love this because it's, it's also the relationship between like self-identity and community identity, working through the way that you're positioning yourself and understanding of others, um, storytelling, right? And Victoria, I don't know if I'm making the assumption, but storytelling strikes me as maybe something that was really important for you in choosing this medium. Is that true for you or... I think it is now, but I honestly am not like the, the reason that I got into photography. It's funny. You said you were into painting and drawing. Cause that was my, that was my start too. I didn't go to school for it. I was like, let me be practical and do graphic design, which is like still what I do for my nine to five. Like, let me, let me get a job. But, <laughs> but uh, I, the camera that I use now is still like, I tell people this and every time I bring it up, I'm like, I don't know if it was the Gainesville flea market or Kennesaw flea market, but one of those that's like, wasn't, that isn't around anymore. Like my dad still to this day, he goes to the La Baquita and always looking for like cool used cheap things. And so he got me an old Canon film camera and he was just like, so you can take pretty pictures. And I didn't ask for it. Like I did like photography just cause I was into the arts, but it wasn't like something I was trying to actively pursue, but because like he had given me this camera um, and it was a film camera. So like, it's, I guess all I'm saying is it really wasn't a deliberate choice. It was like coincidence <laughs> after like coincidence. Like I was given a camera and it was an old film camera and I don't care too much about equipment. So it's still the camera that I use. And also that's lovely. Like I, when you first told me that story, like, I was just like, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but yeah, the storytelling aspect of it, um, I think I'm, I'm just a nerdy person and I nerd out with Yemi all the time about like history and archives and stuff. And I think that photography, uh, lends itself really well to that. And I like getting into like collage a lot too. So, um, photography is nice to collage with, like to see how you can blend photography with like old records or like signs you see in the street, like different other uh, like printed mediums. Um, I've also done zines with photography that um, I've shared with with Yami before, maybe with your class or yes, future Absolutely. things with question mark with some Emory events. Yeah, yeah. no, there was one. There was this. There was an event for Centro uh, for Centro. I think where I brought the zines, but. We will track it down and share with students. Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, okay, y'all had different uh, starts to this, but what strikes me is that it was loved ones in both of y'all's lives that kind of led you to this practice, to this uh, this practice that gave you a medium to capture stories 
that were already animating the way that you moved through the South, the way you saw yourselves, potentially the way you saw your community uh, members. Um, and I just want to point out to our audience, we haven't actually talked about the photographs behind us, right? Here you'll see uh, four images, um, two by Victoria and two by Jose. And I just want to note here that there's themes that appear in both of their bodies of works, especially Latinx experiences with immigration, immigration enforcement, especially with labor, with cultural and leisure practices. And I want to ask you, um, you've, start, you've each started to note this, but I want to ask you how you go about choosing the narratives or the collaborators that you focus on in your work. Jose, you often do a lot of portrait work, a lot of working with individuals. Victoria, you do portrait work as well, but oftentimes it's more of places, especially with Beaufort Highway being so central. So if you can walk us a little bit through what you're looking for when you're going out to take photos for a day, what are the stories that you're excited to tell? I'm gonna let y'all choose who goes first. You want me to go first? <laughs> uh, so I have like this ritual where I just kind of hop on the car and I drive through town and some things just kind of stick out through the city, through my community. And um, I get really obsessive about it. Sometimes I'm like, something st stood out so much that I'll lose sleep over it and uh, I'll talk her ear off about it. Like, hey, I really want to make this image. And, and she's just like, all right, we'll stop talking about it. <laughs> and, just do it. Like, <laughs> you know, and yeah. And um, it's, I mean, I could talk about this for hours, but there's there's some days that you know are really fruitful when it comes to making images, and that that feels gross talking about it in that sense because you're like catching Pokemon or you know like <laughs> you know you're trying to tell the story, right? But, yeah. Um, a lot of things have to come together uh, in order to make an image that I think really does justice or represents the vision that I have or the story that I'm trying to tell. Um, but you know, you see the image and then I really like to, I call it collaborating, but I mean, I, I don't know, I'm still working through that, but, um, I have to, I really want to make a connection with the individual that I'm photographing. I, I really try not to like, can I get your pick and I'm out? Like, I don't know that I, it's all, it's, it all feels really gross sometimes like the ethics of it. I think it's important for us to unpack that. Yeah. So sorry, um, I don't have a formal education in photography, but I know that there are courses that speak to the whole relationship of the person behind the camera and the person in front of it. But um, I, I mean, I'm going to leave this and then we can talk about it later. But I met a photographer like a couple of weeks ago. He did this body of work of black community and he's Asian. And I, I mean, I asked him, I was like, you know, what was that dynamic? And, you know, he's like, he said something that I still think about. He's like, you take a picture, you don't give a picture, right? Like you're taking. So I think about that too. Um, but anyways, uh, it's, it's pretty straightforward. I go, I meet the individuals, whether they're leisurely sitting down, um, prepping some food. I'm thinking about this work that I'm currently making. Um, but there's always this hesitancy of like, dude, what do you want? Why would you want to take my picture? Walk us through your process, Jose. So <laughs> you're driving around, you see yeah. something, you're like, oh, this person, a taquero is on the corner of a street. I want that photo. And you just stop and you're like, hi, I'm Jose. What yeah. Do you oh, yeah. yeah. That is how that's, it works. That's okay. exactly how it works. Um, And it's like, sometimes I'll like park and I'm like creepishly just staring at them. Like, Don't say creepishly. It's creepy. I, I mean, it, <laughs> <laughs> but um you know i'm just thinking about okay well you know how you know where should i where should i take the picture you know just go through these motions but the hardest part is asking that that consent like hey this is a project i'm working on can you help me tell the story um a lot of times it's like oh yeah sure like let's let's do it and then uh, a lot of people dig a little deeper they're like okay but what's your interest behind it um, two gentlemen who were like prepping like these uh, Guatemalan leaves for their tamales, they were outside and the light was hitting them beautifully. And like, I just pulled up, I'm like, what's up guys? And they're like, dude, like what? Like, and they're like, um, one of them was really concerned. They, he like, 
he made jokes about it, but it, it like he was like, "Are you the migra?" And I'm like, you know, like right. that's that's a legitimate concern. Um, I'm like, nah, dude, I'm just like you. Like I've just I've been here my whole life, and um, you know, I I love our culture, I love our people, and like this whole scene that y'all are doing right now is really beautiful. Can you can you help me? Can you help me tell the story? Can I show y'all in a in a different light? So, so yeah. Uh, Ninety percent of the time, people are cool with it. Ten percent, I'm like, they're like, no way, dude, get out of here. Um, but yeah, it sounds like it's part of the process. Um, and you know, we're getting into something I wanted to ask you both. So, Jose, you're starting to reflect on the ethics of it all, on how you build trust in such a short span of time, because these are people you may have never met before and who you may never see again. So, Vicky, I'm curious for you, because Jose, you drive around Metro Atlanta. Victoria, I know that you're around Metro Atlanta, but a lot of your work focuses on a very particular place, Buford Highway. So can you tell us about your process, identifying either sites or people to take photographs of and how that relationship might be like Jose's or maybe differ? I think in I think in a lot of ways, it's pretty similar. Um, I mean, I do basically only photograph like in the area that I live in. So it's like as I'm driving around, I like I have a like a running list in my notes app that I'm like, go back here, take a picture there. Yeah. Um, but I have done a lot less portraiture, like kind of to the point that like Jose is getting to just because I don't like I haven't fully thought out like where I want that to go. And I do have like a tendency to overthink about like the ethics of things, um, but, uh, and the thing you said about like them being like, are you La Migra? There, uh, back in 2019, when I used to do uh, ice chasers with Glar, I remember like, we would wake up super early in the morning. Sorry, Victoria, um, can you tell the folks a little bit about, about what that is, ice chasers with Glar? Oh yes, so Glar is the Georgia Latino Alliance for Human Rights and ice chasers was a group that um would go like we would do like know your rights trainings in different apartment complex mostly apartment complexes but we would go out super early morning um when people were like getting ready to go to work like mostly the men in these apartment complexes because trump had threatened to deport i forget how many people but he was basically like we're going to deport a bunch of people this summer primarily central americans yeah and then there was um like at that time, 287G was still around in Gwinnett County, so that was an issue. And then there was this case in in uh, Brookhaven where Brookhaven had vowed, like, we don't have a 287G contract, so we're not obligated to work with ICE. And then they, like, did it anyway, and this video went viral of them catching these guys going into a van. And, like, once you're out of your house, you have much less protection from stopping them, like, like having to interact with them but so anyway we would go into these apartment complexes very early morning like we would like start the day at like 6 a.m um but we did all of this with the intention of helping these people because we like connected to them because we were involved in community organizing and we personally connected with uh you know the fears that they had that summer because of like what our families had gone through and then a lot of time they would be like are y'all ice so <laughs> and it's like I don't know. It's it's very sensitive. It's like some people really don't want to be bothered. So why am I bothering you? You know, um, like, am I doing it for me? Because like, I just want a photo of you because I think it looks cool. Or like, what's like the greater good of the situation? I don't really have a, f um, a fully fleshed out thought there, but I do think it is important um, because you can go back in time and see, you know, photos of people on Beaufort Highway and like connect with the history of it. So it is important for the archival reasons, but I just think it's a really delicate thing. Um, but I guess uh, to answer your question, like more broadly, uh, I just drive around, I live there in that area. So I see things all the time. And sometimes uh, I have like, like more comfortably, I will shoot people that I know that I have a relationship with. So I'll be like, Hey, do you want, can I take a photo of you? And then, you know, we can plan it out together. And like, we have a good flow of communication because I know them. So, um, now getting into shooting people that I don't have a personal relationship is something that I'm newer to. And it is very like this ad hoc, like, Hey, 
like me and me and, and, and you look cool yeah <laughs> me and me and Vianney uh and Arturo not long ago we were taking photos along Beaufort Highway and there was this guy making pollo salos and we were taking photos for a different reason but we saw him there and he was looking at us so I was like let me engage with him because otherwise he's like what are you guys doing you know so I was like, hey, we're here just like practicing our uh, fotografia, like, eh, si le interesa, le puedo tomar una foto. And he was like, it was really sweet. He was like, thought about it for a second. And then, wait, can I speak in Spanish? That's fine, right? Okay, yeah. He was like, he was like, no, si, si, está bien, me sirve como de recuerdo cuando, uh, like, like when he goes back to his country. And... Um, he just had like I think because that was the motivation of him wanting to get his picture taken he had a lot of pride and so it was like a really beautiful photo because uh he like stood in front of the grill and like did this and was like really really proud of the grill that he makes boy asado on um so that was like a good scenario but I haven't run into the bad ones yet but uh, and another reason I do it less is also just because I as like as a woman I don't feel comfortable approaching strangers and so a lot of the times now if I'm like oh there's a possibility where I may try and do portraiture like see what happens you know like street like portrait photography I'll only do it like if other people are with me I really appreciate that note on gender um and I appreciate this conversation because you know as an academic who does oral histories especially I find myself asking the same questions about my work is this extractive is or, no, it is extractive, but how extractive is it? Can it serve community? What are we actually doing when we're going to our community members and saying, hey, I have this project, I have this vision, can you help me bring it to fruition, right? And they are really complicated questions that I think we should all be grappling with, artists, academics, uh, scholars alike. Um, so one of the things about, one of the positives, right? Although this is extractive, what we're giving back, right? This idea of giving someone a recuerdo, a memory to take back. This idea of showcasing people who are seen as transient, often deportable laborers, but showing them with pride, with dignity. Um, I wanna ask y'all about that, more about that collaboration. Do you pose people? Like Jose, I'm looking at this photo here. Or do po folks strike up their own poses and tell their own story the way that this, um, man working the asador chose to pull, pose himself. How much are folks bringing their own story to bear on the photographs that you're collaborating on? And also what kind of stories do you find people wanting to tell you while you're talking to them? Yeah, so I, for most of my work, there's a mix. Um, I think in those, in those moments, for instance, like the gentlemen who were making the leaves for the tamales that I told you about, like the scene was already set. Um, you know, you just be as you are. I'm going to try to figure out the technical side of me of like how to make a proper exposure. And you just sit there and you keep doing what you're doing. So you look perfect. Keep going. Yeah, yeah. that's gotcha. yeah. So and then there's other times where um, the image, it, I guess you could. It's already made, right? Like, but then sometimes I do I do construct it, right? For instance, this this couple like that is that is constructed. Um, you know, there's a dialogue of like, hey, you know, I have this vision. Uh, this, this, the guy, uh, I played soccer with him um, and he had this, he was very unique features and he was all about it. So we just met up and, and made these um, images by the lake. And I, I had been wanting to photograph by a lake because there's so many lakes around Gainesville. So geographically it spoke to, you know, where I was from. Um, but this other image, for example, was for an assignment and um literally i'm just like he like picks up the squash the bucket of squash and i'm like hold it and i take the image um so yeah it's like some of them are really organic and then sometimes like i do like to put my hand and like um you know kind of construct it uh in a sense but um and then yeah i mean I think once, I mean, I, that's at the very, like, how is the image made? But, uh, I I really like to, like, a big part of it is, like, connecting with the people. Like, because it becomes, like, um, at least for me, it's it's lately become, like, like, like therapy in a sense. Like, yeah. like um, 
yeah, I am Mexican. You know, like, you know, like you forget that. Like, like it's affirming to you. Or... Yeah. Yeah. Because you, we're just, we live these really comfortable lifestyles here. Right. And I, I think that I take a lot of things for granted. Um, I mean, nothing was given, right. We, we worked, my parents have worked for it, but just thinking about the relationship to being back in Mexico, the way my cousins live, the way my tias live, how hard they grind. Uh, they don't get to be artists. So like thinking about those things, um, uh, making these images and connecting to people it's like all right yeah that, that is that is me right so it's like that's that's where the identity component comes to it um so having talks about home about what they what it is that they miss about home how long they've been here uh conversations of migration what was their experience that's where we find that common ground and i think that's where really like uh it goes beyond beyond the photo um, I love this, this sort of point that it's to, through talking to others and getting this wider understanding of a broad Latinx migrant experience of the South is affirming, right? And reminds you of where you come from and who you are and allows you to stand strongly in that. Um, this question of home is so important. And Vic Victoria, I want to ask you, you started ph photographing a place that was home, that you left for a little bit is home again. Has your relationship to Buford Highway developed, strengthened, changed through this particular practice of photography? Do you see the place that you live in differently now? Or have you found it? I mean, let me stop there. Has it changed for you over time? <laughs> yeah, I, th I think it's made me like aggressively protective over it. <laughs> Good. <laughs> <laughs> um. But I mean, I lived there and it was like a part of me, but I wasn't necessarily like super conscious about it or like critical of things going on. And because I have this ongoing practice that requires me living there and me going out frequently there, it it is something that's like, okay, this is just like, you know, where I live, where I see my friends, where I uh, buy groceries or whatever, you know, it's also like where I have like my artistic practice contained so it's like something that uh you you just have like a more critical view of and um anytime like a sign changes or like a new thing is being built you're like ah oh, who's behind that you know like what's going on here <laughs> but it's um because i like to have this like uh historical context as well um, which I've gained a lot of knowledge from from Yemi, uh, that is also something that stays top of mind for me. So like lately, um, I noticed that Dorville was having more public art, which I was like, you know what, why did we never have any public art? Because, But because I like notice things more because I'm more invested in the area, um, I'll, I'll ask more questions. And so then I found out from someone that it was like part of the city code that public art was was banned in Dorville, most likely because they didn't want immigrants like making the area look tacky and too colorful because they were trying to maintain like a very white, like literally like racially white, but also like clean white like aesthetic. Um, and then and then I've noticed like all these uh, Bengali businesses opening. So then I'll ask questions about that. Like I just ask hella, hella questions because I'm like, this is gonna plug into something eventually. And like, I need to know because soy bien chismosa. But the thing with the Bengali businesses when I asked was like, oh, there's a bank on Beaufort Highway that has a new Bengali banker. And so uh, people who, Bengali people who want to open a business now have a banker that will work with them, which I'm like, that's why I learned from Yami, like the origins of so many Chinese and Korean businesses is, and even like a lot of Latino businesses, they're Latino businesses, but they'll be owned by not Latino people, but people who have like access to bankers. So I don't know, you just, you it makes you walk around your own neighborhood with like a constant critical consciousness, which maybe isn't always good for your mental health or like <laughs> your levels of anxiety, but, um, but you're, you're cognizant. Of you're this. cognizant. Yeah. And, and Victoria, you just said, and this is what, um, you know, Jose was articulating too, that the, the camera photography as a practice has resulted or informed this development of a critical consciousness. 
about what it means to be Latinx in the South, about the struggles of these communities, especially, again, given the bodies of work that you each produce, working class, often undocumented, often people working in vulnerable ty uh, types of work, um, but also creatives, young folks who are bringing a sort of new identity to bear on the South, being very proud in their Latinidad, their Southerness, and their in-betweenness, right? So before we turn it over to our audience for questions, I wanna ask y'all to think broadly across time and space. And I wanna ask you, how can your work not just tell us about the contemporary Latinx experience, but maybe teach us about the past, the history, or the potential future, the hopes, the aspirations for our Southern Latinx community? That's tough, that's all you. <laughs> no, you're both gonna answer, Jose, go find Victoria. <laughs> I'll give you time to think. Um, so again, I'm I'm gonna keep shouting you out just because like I, I tap into her like all the time for my work. It's a really good way to like ground yourself and in, in what in what you're doing. So if you do local stuff, I'm happy to talk to you. <laughs> <laughs> as far as like looking back in the past, well, I think like doing this gives you proof that like we've been here for a long time. And like like I was saying earlier about the Olympics, people are like oh, you know, all, all the immigrants came to Atlanta like during the Olympics. So for like that boom in construction and the economy, the local economy, but that's not true. And if you like work um, asking people questions, like getting to know people, you'll know that they have lots of history here that's that, like far predates that. Even like your abuelo as a, like, working as a bracero, like it's just, there's like a lack of, of visible reminders of that. And so I think photography is a great way to, to, work towards improving that awareness and working towards the future. Um, I mean, I think it will give people like a better place of belonging to, um, I hope that like seeing themselves um, and their areas like represented and well documented will give them a better sense of belonging in the future. And my hope is for like the Beaufort Highway area to have all the things that west coast latinos get to have like there is nothing in atlanta where like any group or like our our chinatown is so small it's like a little shopping center but um i hope in the future that there is like these more well-established like ethnic enclaves and it will be in part at least because of like these creative efforts that help to like bring communities together and create these um these visuals that helps like unite people or create a sense of belonging is that a good answer? Dreaming of walkable cities. Okay. Yes. <laughs> we need the, what is it, the third space? Yes. Yes. Jose? That was a really long question, but I'm going to give it a go. Okay. okay. Um, I Where think we pick up? making these images, um, just thinking about my own experience and from the places that we come from, there's very little reference points of what we could be. Um, so, you know, I think about photography in the sense of like, if I photograph it, it happened, right? It was a moment, right? And to be able to like circulate these images, whether it's exhibitions, talks, so on and so forth, just as a testament to the very diverse and complex experiences that we live day by day. So I think that that's where my artistic contribution, I think that's, that's the intent behind it. Um, and yeah, just like, it's so important for people to be seen. I think uh, the relationships that are built with the people that are photographed, like for them to feel that way too, like that, that you're not just living in this world, working day by day, like you are appreciated, your culture is beautiful, uh, that, that has value. So um, I think moving forward, like the South in itself, like I, like, I mean, even in conversation with this exhibition, right, it's like, I don't know if Pilar is aware of like Southern artists, but we're here, right? So here we are bringing attention to the work that's being made here because our experience is so new. Um, it's new, but also it's also we've been here, right? So now here's proof, here's evidence. So uh, yeah, I think we're in a really interesting and exciting time. And yeah, I'm looking forward to see what Atlanta can continue, continue to bring to, you know, the American landscape of art and just in general. And um, 
again, as a historian, I just want to thank you both for the work you do, for giving me an exciting visual historical archive to work with, to teach with. And that also really affirms me and validates my lived experiences. Um, thank y'all for the work you do. Please join me in thanking our discussants tonight.